Hello and welcome to the Investor's Champion podcast. The goal of this podcast is to give you a quick but informative rundown of some interesting topics affecting UK investors and a rundown of the biggest movers in the UK share market, including AIM and some bonkers bargains for you to take a closer look at. Let's get started. Hi Chris, good to see you again. Hello Lee, good to be here on another wet and miserable day down south anyway. Yeah, we're in those autumn slash winter months now, aren't we? It's, yeah, it's, it's getting a bit grim. Getting a bit getting grim. Hopefully good for investment, though. We need some boosts. We need an investment boost. Yes. Speaking of boosters, nice little segue there. You've been getting some emails in, haven't you, around dividend producing stocks and in particular around the income boosters portfolio. So we thought we'd do an episode dedicated purely to dividend producing stocks, the income boosters portfolio and the aim for high yield portfolio. Because I guess if some people are emailing in, then there's probably other people that have similar sort of questions. What type of stocks do you have in it? And how do you find these stocks? What type of metrics do you look for? Yeah, um, it's an interesting topic and it's a big topic for, I think a lot of UK investors predominantly love their dividends and they like dividend income. It's the one thing that's very reliable from yeah. UK stocks. So yeah, people are interested in it. You compared the S&P 500 to the FTSE 100 and the, the, the contrast between the two and how much the dividends play in the FTSE 100. Yeah, I mean, dividend income is a big part of the FTSE. The dinosaurs of the FTSE are big payers of dividends to shareholders. It seems that the big shareholders, big pension funds like the dividends, like the income. So yeah, when people compare two indices, they get a bit blinded by the fact that the, the index is only represents the capital growth of the two indices and ignores dividends. And the FTSE typically is yielded, given a dividend yield, an income yield of around about 4% over the years. And the S&P is a fraction of that, you know, under half of that. So you can see that if you compound 4% over a long period, it starts to become quite meaningful in the index return. And if you add that to the FTSE 100, I saw some stat that commented, well, the UK blue chip index only rose back to what it last hit in the last century in um, 2015. However, if you'd have compounded the dividends and factored those in, it would have actually got back to its level much quicker, about eight years quicker. So you can see that the dividends have been a big component of the growth. Now, the current yield of the FTSE is just under 4%, was about 3.6%. The dividend yield has fallen as the index uh, has risen, as such is the nature of the way the yield works. The dividend being the dividend per share, being that divided by the share price goes up, the yield falls. FTSE 100 big dividend pair, the FTSE 250 big dividend pair. And as we're going along to see, even AIM shares, even smaller AIM shares, offer some really attractive dividends. And as these are growth stocks, you can sometimes get, if you buy wisely, both dividends, nice dividend, and some decent capital growth as well. With regards to the income boosters portfolio, so what is it that you look for within the income boosters portfolio for a stock? What's the objective of that portfolio? The income boosters portfolio is we focus our, our selection criteria based on main market listed companies that have market capitalizations typically of around a billion pounds or more around. Some of them are a little bit lower than that, typically around a billion on inception and offer a, a, it's above average being above the FTSE 100. With interest rates elevated, clearly we feel we've got to push it even higher. So the, the yield on our income boosters has been around about 6%, which is several points above the, the FTSE 100, but not much more than you know what you can get on the bank in, on a longer term fixed interest. So we're trying to actually push it closer to 7%. It's a 20 stock portfolio comprising of, of reliable dividend pairs in terms of reliability. We like to see companies with a history of dividend growth and earnings growth and also good dividend cover. So typically the cover is more than one and a half times earnings, but decent cash cover. So we want the dividends to be covered by the free cash generation of, of the business. Our income boosters portfolio is a 20 stock portfolio of shares. Our associated business fundamental asset manager runs a more diverse income, but with a few more income generating shares in it. The key is on that reliability of dividend income. You'll see from some of the things we'll discuss, if we feel a dividend's in jeopardy or being cut, our inclination is to cut the stock and find a replacement. There is loads to choose from. Remember that universe is both the FTSE 100 and the FTSE 250, generally speaking, given the size we're looking at. So there's a big universe of stocks to, to look for. Can we share a couple of examples that we've got in the portfolio at the moment? 
Yeah, yeah, we can give you a few. So we'll start with the good and probably f end with a couple of the not so good. So yeah, I no, mean, that's, that's what, good. It's good to have the contrast, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, so well, can... you, you can't just give good stories on this. We exactly. did well to, for example, buy into Howard Greaves Lansdowne, financial services sector, broker, back in May 2023. This is well before any thoughts of buyouts were on the table. The shares look very cheap to us, a reliable dividend payer. It was benefiting from elevated interest rates. Nobody liked the stock. It was it had spent badly on new technology. So we bought in well. It's delivered a 40% plus return for us and some nice dividend income. I think the yield at the time was about approaching 5%. So Hargreaves stands out. Another financial services sector stock, IG Group, another broker. A broker involved principally in contracts for different spread betting, but it also has mainstream stock broking. The shares have done well this year. Again, it looked very cheap to us, decent value. Nobody liked it a few years ago when we kicked off the income boosters. The dividend yield's currently five and a bit percent. It's got some sorting out to do. Typically, when the yields are high, we get a lot of stocks that are really unloved. People don't like them. They're a bit contrarian, the plays. So with that, you can get sucked into so-called value traps and they can disappoint. But over time, you can also see some quite decent recovery potential. There's plenty of financial service exposure. Those two are two examples. An example that, of a stock that most people will be very familiar with, which nearly every dividend paying fund will hold is National Grid. We used to hold it, but sold out of it. I know we discussed National Grid on this on these podcasts before. And why did we sell out of it? Because it's dividend cut. And our view, well, our surprise after it announced this surprise and rights issue, £7 billion rights issue, we thought it was it looked totally bonkers to us. So it's raising a load of more, more money, upping the dividends as well. So it's effectively raising money to shove it straight out to shareholders again at huge costs as well. It's costing the absolute fortune. So it, that left a bad taste. We don't like the thought of it. So somewhat contrary play, we ditched National Grid despite the fact it was a good payer, but we, to us, the, 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 there was zero capital growth there or questionable growth. And we replaced that at the time, odd replace, some may view, with uh, a closed-ended investment fund called the Supermarket Income REIT. A REIT is a real estate investment trust, and the Supermarket Income REIT, as the its name implies, has a portfolio of supermarkets. It owns the properties. So the likes of Tesco rent a property that may be owned, the property itself, the building, by the supermarket income REIT. So it has very good tenants, very reliable tenants in the likes of Tesco's and Sainsbury's. And the supermarket income REIT has debt as well, but they look managed. Well, it yields about 8%. And that we felt was a, a good sort of elevated um, dividend play for us. And with the benefit with the, of these of these REITs and closed-end investment trusts, a lot of them trade as so-called discounts. The market capitalization per their share price is a discount to the value, the net value after debt of their assets. And we feel that these discounts could start to narrow and interest rates start coming back. We feel the elevated payouts that they're offering, ele elevated dividend payouts, will strike to attract more buyers. And that discount could narrow and we'll get some capital growth from it as well. Another recent change is a business called Page Group. We sold out a Page Group, the recruitment business. We found it odd. The business is struggling at the moment, but it decided to up its dividend, which looked very odd, which meant the dividend cover was non-existent. It was waiting for the sun to shine again. We prefer companies to pay out dividends when they're currently affordable, not when they might be affordable in some point in the future. What did you replace that with? That is currently under review. It only happened at the end of the last month, I think. So we're yeah. currently under review. We're currently considering. Most of our focus has been on some other closed-end investment trusts, some infrastructure trusts. We're likely to replace it with uh, one of those and so where we feel we can get some elevated yield as well. So clearly from what you've said there, the portfolio consists of not just stocks. It's why do you think the UK larger companies seem to be heavily weighted towards dividends, contrast to the S&P 500? Instead of reinvested in the company for growth, we're now sending them out as higher I dividends. I think it's a bizarre. It's an interesting. I mean, you can't level it really the pension funds because the pension fund investments in UK equities has dropped from, I think, 25% a few decades ago to now for just 4% last time right. somebody. So, yeah, pension funds should typically be responsible. There, then the insurance companies, they've got the big deep pockets. They're constantly loading up on inv with investments and on equities. It's an odd scenario. You're right. It's somewhat catastrophic that capital investment in growth 
the UK PLC at the highest level has really prioritized dividend payments, which is somewhat frustrating. We previously discussed the, the sort of capital models of big tobacco groups where they paying out vast amounts of dividends. And you wonder how much better use they could have got out of all that cash by reinvesting in other areas of growth, even if it meant outside of their, their tobacco hotspot. It's somewhat unusual because these are pretty good businesses. Some of these companies generate a heap of income, but their priority has been to, to pay it out. And clearly, sometimes probably some are doing it in excess of what they should have been. But yeah, I, ha, how it has evolved, who knows? One has to go back probably a long time before my time to see when the changes started happening. But it, it's very frustrating. Yeah, agreed, agreed. Should we move on to the AIM high yield portfolio? Because their company is primarily from the FTSE 250 to the FTSE 100. And yeah. just thinking about some of our listeners, there's probably a quite a large percentage of our listeners that particularly focus on AIM companies. So it'd be good for you to just to share the objectives of the AIM for high yield portfolio. Yeah, years ago, we, as in our associated firm, Fundamental Asset Management, tried to run a high dividend paying AIM portfolio. And it was a, to be fair, it was a complete disaster. This was a decade or so ago. We've been big investors in AIM. We're pretty familiar with it, more than a decade ago. And it, AIM had a lot of more companies than it does now. And a lot of, they had a lot of even smaller companies, a lot of old companies as well. And we thought we'd run a income portfolio and it didn't perform well because you were effectively sucked into a lot of value traps. Well, we revisited this in October, 2022 around then or in 2020, halfway through 2022, because AIM has shrunk. The number of our companies in AIM has shrunk just over 700 and something, but the quality has improved. So you've got rid of a lot of the legacy. Uh, stuff that had to questionable business models. You've got a lot of good businesses that have been around a long time and have got consistent track record of dividend payments. And it looked far more attractive. Companies as well, the balance sheets were in decent shape. A lot of them are sitting on lots of cash, limited debt. So we thought, let's launch a dedicated AIM income portfolio. So in conjunction with, as I say, Fundamental, Investors Champion launched its AIM for high yield portfolio. The estimated yield on inception was around 5%. So that's lower than the income boosters, but 5% dividend yield from a portfolio of um, 16 AIM companies. For many, that would maybe too concentrated. If you want something bigger, our associates fundamental, run a, a larger 25 stock equal weighting on inception, AIM for high yield portfolio with a similar yield. So you can see we can expand the portfolio. For AIM, all of the companies we assessed qualify for the business relief. So that's inheritance tax relief. So they're all qualifying for those purposes. The minimum market capitalization, it was the size of them was only 50 million pounds. They're a lot smaller and they're a lot smaller than the average size of our normal AIM growth model. So these are smaller average same companies. There are a few biggies in six, 700 million pound stocks. A lot of them are at the smaller end. So 16 stocks portfolio, avoiding too many changes. So this is very much buy and hold unless we get really uncomfortable with the dividend cover or we get takeovers, which we've had a few. And we kicked this off in 2022. By the end of June 2024, uh, it had returned about 30 odd percent, including dividends, which isn't bad because over the same period, the AIM index was down four and a bit percent. So we're quite pleased and ignored dividend on the AIM index. But yeah, so it, it outperformed. It's post June, it's come back somewhat because nobody likes AIM over the last few months. Everybody's worried about tax changes, there's been a lot of selling, but it's still holding its head well above water and it's generated some decent dividends along the way. We got a bit more bang from several of our, because the positions are bigger, That's we got bigger. some high performers, though to be one that we'll talk about, I really up that as well, up the impact it had. Uh, yeah, but it's done, it's done pretty well. Which company was that? Which one did pretty well? The company question was Warpaint. And Warpaint is a colours cosmetics business. It's been a terrific performer over the last few years. Now I'm two years now since we've been running this. Delivered about, delivered about 280% since we first chose the stock. And you may wonder, people reading this may, or listening to this may wonder, why on earth did we choose Warpaint as a dividend stock? Because the yield now is only two and a bit percent. When we first invested into it, it was 4.7%, 4 4 I think, something like that, the dividend yield. So the dividend was the driver. But as I said, the beauty of this is you're in small growth companies. Warpaint is still a growth stock. Crikey, the management will be wanting to shoot me if I thought it was a dividend play. But yeah, it's so it's a growth company that had an at the time an inflated yield. And that's the nature of some of these AIM stocks. 
you can win both ways. You can get sucked into value traps. You can get sucked into periods of immense depression. But yeah, the, the possibility is for them to deliver some meaningful capital growth as well. And war paint is one such example. And we're sticking with it. While the yield for an incoming buyer at this point is only two and a bit percent now, it's still part of our composition and we're running it because we think it looks in decent shape. And it's, it's got a very efficient, low capex model. All the manufacturers subcontracted out. It's a marketing distribution organization. So yeah, long may it continue for war paint. Does it factor in as well that a lot of the companies that Fundamental and yourself like to invest in found the owned, family owned, because they probably enjoy the, the added benefit of a dividend? James Halstead, I'm thinking of perhaps. Maybe. Yeah, good point. They, they've just announced actually and 50 years of dividends, 50 years of dividend growth, James Halstead, growing dividends, which is pretty impressive. Yeah. Again, family controlled, family owned, lots of relations of family as well. You're not necessarily on the board. Warpaint as well, founder owned. Maybe they like their divvies. Yeah. It means they can probably keep their remuneration to more modest levels and the thought they're, they're benefiting from a whacking great dividend as well. It's good all round. We love founder-led businesses. Yes, you're right. A lot of these are pay out decent dividends. In your view, the AIM landscape from a dividend perspective is quite a bit different from circa 15 years ago. Oh, yeah, it's totally different. Totally different. As I said, you had, you know, AIM was still in its relative infancy. 1995, it kicked off. So it was still relatively young. And uh, you had a lot of the companies with pure growth, still investing, little spare cash, little spare capital. What they had was all going to support growth. Fast forward now to 2024. They're a lot, they're more mature. A lot of them have got well-developed, proven business models. And when they've got excess cash, they can divvy it out. It's a more attractive space for that. Yeah. It's still a risk because we come across stocks that the dividends are, are cut and we get out. Another good performer, again, playing on that family owner, founder ownership recently, has been Mattioli Woods. We bought that as a yield player, got a takeover, unfortunately, we got, but we got a, a decent boost out of it. So Mattioli Woods was another constituent of our aim for high yield. Again, it had that constituent of that uh, attribute of being still overseen by one of its founders. So play the other side of the founder control business. Poor performer has been RWS Holdings. We've held this stock on and off in a lot of our portfolios for a long time. It's a provider of term now technology enabled language, content and intellectual property. It was once one of AIM's largest companies, uh, or was, was it almost its largest? It was over a billion and a bit. Now it's 700 odd. Everybody's worried that AI is a sort of existential threat to its business. RWS to counter that is doing its best to say, look, we're ahead of the game in AI. We've invested a lot of it. It's not, it's actually going to be a boost, but the market doesn't believe it. And the returns have struggled a bit, but RWS now, from what many perceived as a growth stock, clearly growth has hit the buffers, it yields 7.6% as I speak. There you've got the founder, non-exec, or non-exec director now, still owns a huge stake in that business that he's never sold a share. But yeah, he's picking up a decent dividend yield, even though, even worth the shares, even though his capital value has declined materially. What would it take for you to remove them from the portfolio then? Clearly, if the dividends are no longer affordable, if there is no way forward, if we, if, if taking that scenario, if AI is really a massive threat and that will be borne out more in the next results, clearly the, the signs that haven't been fabulous, but I think it's been overplayed. The shares look oversold to us. So we'll stick with it. If it looks really similar, we'll, we'll be obliged to, to get out. So what's the pros and cons of a dividend portfolio versus a growth portfolio? Or is that a subjective question based on far too many circumstances? No, it's not. It's a good question. In terms of the AIM portfolio, you could say, should a growth stock, put another way, should a growth stock really be paying big dividends at all? If it can return if it can generate high margins and high returns on equity, the best thing it should be doing with any spare cash is reinvesting in the business to generate returns. So it could be considered questionable taking RWS. Has it run out of ideas in, in which to invest? Is the cash so excessive that that's the case? So that's the fear. Growth of stumble. And the, and the same scenario applies to the main market stocks as well. Are they paying out too much? Take an example of a fabulous main market stock, Halmer. 
which has used the cash it's generated to make a series of acquisitions. Helmer's in the, the business of scientific instruments testing. It's been a massive success story on the main stock market. I don't know what the value is, 10 billion or more now, but it's a, a, you know, a fabulous business. And management there have clearly prioritized over the years, reinvesting cash in support of acquisitions. So the yield is minuscule relative. And it's been all about using cash to grow. Maybe others should have adopted a similar approach. Unfortunately, maybe their management teams didn't have the skill set to do it. Making effective acquisitions. And Helm has always made niche little bolt-on acquisitions. So sometimes our fear is companies get a load of cash they get the support from the shares. They make these so-called transformational deals. Just as I was speaking, two AIM companies have made done tra transformational deals. They're, they scare the living daylights out of me. They're, they're normally transformational for all, ultimately for all the wrong reasons. They generally overpay the sellers, a seller selling in an odd market, especially at the moment. I'm, I'm even more questioned on transformational deals because the market, the small cap market's really in the doldrums. So why should you be overpaying? Yeah, one of them, I'll mention one of them, Iomart, is a constituent of our aim for high yield portfolio. It's cloud services business, it provides data centers, and it's just made a big acquisition at what looks like a huge premium price for a business that's fully embedded in Microsoft. It's calling it transformational. And you don't like those buzzwords? <laughs> I hate buzzwords, full stop. Uh, <laughs> but transformational, small companies buying businesses that are for a sort of similar value of their own before the deal always seem to hit problems. It's oft, often problematic. I don't mind little incremental deals, but big jobs are often found wanting. And well, we've seen that on numerous occasions. So what will you do then in regards to that? Then you, The alarm bells are ringing. But there's nothing yep. yet for you to do. No, yet. alarm bells are ringing. In that instance, alarm bells are ringing big time and we're, we're inclined to drop it, I would say. Oh, right. Like, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the yield superficially looks high, but the capital's been whacked. The shares are pretty weak. We've got this big deal now, so we're likely to, to offload it. And yeah. not at the moment, but I'm saying now I'm being open about it, that, yeah, it's not, a, it's not the type of thing we like. And this is a business that's made lots of acquisitions before. Despite the acquisitions, revenues actually declined which is already isn't a good look. And now it, it's, it seems an act of desperation that its existing business has been it's floundering. We need a, a massive transformational deal to change things. Almost change the yeah. business model type thing. Yeah. On the oh. same day, coincidentally, another AIM company called Impact, which I know far less about, has also done a huge deal. It's a similar size to itself at the moment, um, but I know less about it. It's had to raise new money. Iomart's, Iomart's transacted its deal out of its own resources, debt arrangements, has access to debt. I mean, in fairness to Arma, in support, the cash flow is pretty strong, although I think free cash flows, real free cash flow is nowhere near as attractive as people are led to believe on it because they seem to have to make so much capital investment each year just to stand still. Impact has had to go to its shareholders and raise a heap of new money. I know less about it, but people are calling this transformational, which, again, that buzzword <laughs> yeah, scares me. Never a dull day in the markets, is it? Certainly not in AIM. No, no, never a dull day, any. Never a dull <laughs> yeah. day. I hope the audience appreciate what they've just listened to because I think the buying the stocks is one thing. A lot of people can get caught up on what stock to buy, can't they? But when to exit, and certainly for companies, and that perhaps maybe doing what you hoped it would do, that's just as important, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And I, I think that was a failure. It has been a failure, perhaps, of our income boosters model. We weren't quick enough to exit sometimes where we felt that there was a, a weakness, a dividend cover weakness or a dividend payout weakness because some of these big stocks forced into keeping to continue to pay dividends to satisfy their shareholders that demand them because they're on their income plays for all these big funds. Mm -hmm. And we probably needed to be more ruthless there. With AIM, it's often in, in size, it's much harder to be more ruthless because the shares aren't that liquid. Yeah. So if you manage hundreds of millions in AIM, it's hard to get out because you, there's no liquidity in the stock, especially in a stock that nobody likes. This has been really brilliant. It's been really eye-opening listening to you. I've really enjoyed it. I hope the audience has as well. But let's hypothetically say someone's thinking, you know what? Yeah, I can see the sense in the building an income producing portfolio. Where would they start? What would they do to begin with? Apart from signing up to Investors Champion and they've got the income yeah. boosters portfolio there and the AIM yeah. for high yield portfolio. So... It's already done. Where would they start? Well, that would I'll be give the a first shout step. out to a, you know, a site, Stockopedia. Stockopedia, you yeah. can go onto Stockopedia and they, you, can, you can filter things by dividend income. It, in main market stocks, that provides a pretty reliable 
guide as to what looks appealing. So you can filter income, forecast dividend income, historic, trailing four months. So it gives you a good shot and then you can see what dividend cover is. And for main markets, that gives you a pretty reliable way of honing down some, some possible interesting dividend payers. In terms of AIM, that could also be a starting point. But it's only a starting point because the, the, the forecasts are so unreliable and the detail, the data, the, the detail is offers the true guide of what's affordable. So I would say, again, that, that can give you a, an initial look, but then you have to do a lot of your own work, a lot of your own exploratory work. And always build as well. I would always encourage people to build a well-balanced, diversified portfolio. Again, 16 stocks is probably too few in a you need to probably build it up to 25 to have a decent balance. Keep your transaction costs low as well. Keep an eye on things. You really got to keep an eye on things. Check out, regularly check, check out results. If you're not at all comfortable, give it to a professional to do. Why did you choose 16 then? Why did you settle on 16? It just seemed a nice uh, sort of eye opener without going the whole hog. And it was controllable for us to report on Investors Champion to give a sort of little idea of what's possible in that the possibilities are, are good. Yeah, brilliant. Is there anything that you think we've not covered that you would like to have share with the audience? Probably the special dividends is worth mentioning. We mentioned one company recently, James Halstead, and the yields you often see, the forecast yields, don't factor in the potential of specials. And a lot of companies get excess cash. They chuck out a special dividend. And so when you're assessing dividend yields, you've got to hope occasionally you get some of those which boost it, but don't necessarily appear in all the data. And James House said has delivered some specials over time. Another stock that we don't hold at the moment, which I'm by actually a whole person plus 500, was another spread betting CFD provider group in the financial services sector. That's had a history of loads of special dividends and loads of dividends. Have a, have a close look at special dividends because they can give you bountiful rewards. Brilliant. Shall we leave it there? Yeah. Hopefully that's informative. I think it was. Yes. It's not a perfect science. More an art. It, it certainly <laughs> is, isn't it? It's definitely an art. I thought it was brilliant. Really enjoyed it. And hopefully those questions that have been filtering in around the dividend side of things, hopefully that's given them a good insight and indeed the rest of the audience. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Chris. Thanks very much. Bye. Well, that's it for today. Please subscribe for next week's episode as we will once again discuss global events, the UK share market and some more bonkers bargains for you to take a closer look at. If you want to take a deeper dive into any of these topics and indeed more exciting and interesting companies, then please feel free to visit investorschampion.com to learn more. All the links are just in the show notes just below. Many thanks for listening and we hope you have a great day.